Hey, uh, any of you heard about this uh, Ashbury University in uh, Wilmore, Kentucky that's had a uh, spontaneous revival meeting that started in a chapel service last Wednesday and is still going on, continuous? Any of you heard of it? Well, a few of you have. Anyway, we're going to start our own marathon revival service right now, so please stand. You guys didn't think that was funny at all, did you? Join as we sing, praise to the Father. Spirit free, Holy Spirit, work through me. Holy Father, show us your ways. Holy Father, Almighty, worthy of praise. Praise to the Father. Spirit free, Holy Spirit, work through me. Holy Father, show us your ways. Holy Father, Almighty, you're worthy of praise. Praise to the Father, the Son, and the Holy One who gave us truth and the life. Praise to Good job. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, the sunshine and the warmth. Thank you for that, Father. Father, we just pray that you pour down your blessings upon us as we worship you. Pour down your blessings upon Pastor Josh as he brings a message to us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. We have a treat for you this morning. Our chairman of our family Pastor Search Committee is going to give a report. Mark. Hey, buddy. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Just to let you know, for those of you who don't know, we are in the process of getting a family pastor. Uh, right now, we've got a committee that's meeting. Um, we've already had a couple of meetings, and we're going through right now resumes and setting up for interviews. So what we will do will keep you... Uh, updated on what we find out and if you have any questions or anything you can please let me know thank you thank you mark good morning good to be here has anyone lost this bracelet no it's not yours <laughs> anybody lost this bracelet If not, it's magnet. Yeah, it's magnetic. <laughs> That's your Valentine present. <laughs> All right, real important thing. On the, on Sunday, on Sunday the 26th, 
that's our day to take cookies to the policeman. So between now and Sunday the 26th, you need to bake cookies, ladies, men, put them in a one quart plastic bag, then we repackage them into a paper bag and put some stuff in the church, and then we will deliver them down to the police. So you've got two weeks to get ready. Two weeks. The 26th, bring in your cookies. Normally we get 70 or 80 dozen, so keep doing it. I asked our gentleman in the back, the policeman, I said, do you remember getting those? He said, yeah. So they do get them. It is a ministry for us. All right, tonight, prayer service all of a sudden is from 4 to 5. You've got to wake up because afterwards is a big Super Bowl party on the big screen. So you can come and root for whatever team you want, or you can come and talk to everybody you want. You know, I'm not a real football fan, so being on the screen or not doesn't matter, but the fellowship is worth it. All right, men, February the 25th, we have our breakfast with Darren Casper, our associational leader coming, and then don't forget Wednesday night, our community meal, and Awanas comes. Oh, look at the community meal. Cheeseburger, tater tot, green beans, dinner roll, dessert. Man, you better be here. That's all I got to say. And don't forget to bring snacks tonight, as my lovely wife reminded me. Thank you. God bless you. And it's good to be back out of the cold. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Isn't it good to be in the Lord's house this morning? It yes. is. And I'd just like to welcome, on behalf of First Baptist Church of Oakville, welcome each of you to... Uh, the service here in person and also those that are joining online we are so glad that you uh, chose to watch us on through our streaming services Facebook live YouTube live twitch and a couple others probably and so glad uh, that you join us that way to let you know a little bit about us we love God we love each other and we love you and we like to greet each other and sing a song so I'd like to ask for you to stand greet each other as we sing do Lord <laughs> Light of mine, and I'm gonna let it shine. 
If you would, find your seats. As we continue worship and song, those that follow along in your hymnals, 410. A classic gospel song, It Is Well With My Soul.
offertory song. Join as we sing your great name.
Good morning, everyone. Little did I know when I was a small child, a little prayer that I learned, God is good and God is great. Though I mean so much now. God has been good to this church. It's so good to see some of you that haven't been able to make it before for some time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine and the warmth. It's such a blessing to us to help us get through the, the tougher times. We thank you for those that have been able to come out today that don't normally get to come out. We thank you for everything that you've done for us in this church. We ask that you bless us as we give back to you something that you have given to us to allow us to be in this world. These things we ask in your name. Amen. in song. This is a song that Margie Bishop had asked me to learn and sing here at church. And three weeks later, she died. She wanted it sung at her funeral. And Jerry had asked me to sing it again, please. And there's others that have requested the song because it's a wonderful message. Listen to the words.
All right. As always, it's great to be in God's house with you. And welcome to those watching online. Uh, just to know, I want to say something real quick. Thankful for our crew in the back. Uh, whether you realize it or not, that is a high pressure job back there. As if you didn't know this, technology always doesn't work right. And so even this morning as we got going, the system crashed. They had to reboot it real quick. So we're th I'm thankful for them. And so uh, make sure you show your appreciation to them at some point. Ah. Uh, I do want to remind you also, this is your last week to vote on which parable you want to hear me preach. And so uh, right now we've had 21 votes, so I expect a little bit more than that. Uh, and it is a tight race. And so every vote counts. Uh, so make sure you vote today. All right. And I'll just say this. The one I want to win is at the bottom. <laughs> and so if, you're, if you want to get brownie points, you can ask me what it is later. And we'll stuff the ballot. All right. I also wanted to note something, and they're not here this morning. But one thing I, I feel that we always should try to draw attention to is marriage with the high divorce rate we have in our culture and, and even the high divorce rate we have within the church. Um, it's something to celebrate when we see couples stay together and are celebrating each other for a long period. And so we had Rich and Shelba a few weeks ago at 57 years, but last Monday, and I've shared it every time I've had an opportunity, we had Cliff and Joyce, and they're at home, celebrated 63 years. And so, and so that is just something to be so thankful for. The example that, that, that they have set in their life is just wonderful. So when you see them, uh, they should be there tonight, so uh, say something to them. All right. This parable uh, that we're looking at today is the third parable to have an explanation attached to it. All right, so the ones prior to that, as we saw with the parable of the sower, and then the parable of the weeds had one as well. And in the parable of the net, it's similar to that of the parable of the weeds. In the parables we have covered so far, Jesus has spoken of the importance of the kingdom of God and salvation. And in this parable, Jesus focuses on the judgment of sinners who remain unrepentant and unwilling to follow him sacrificially. Again, parables were useful in that they used everyday scenarios to illustrate the points Jesus was making. So, so even if the listener wasn't grasping completely what Jesus was saying, they at least were familiar with the context he was speaking in. And today's parable is really no different in that Jesus uses a very common practice, fishing. I know we have some fisher, uh, fishermen in our, uh, in our congregation, and I know we also have some who loathe fishing completely. I won't name names. I'm going to let them implicate themselves. <laughs> so at this time, there were, there were three basic ways to fish. All right? and, and realistically, these three methods are, are still very much used today, and they're definitely still used at the Sea of Galilee. 
And one is simply with a line and a hook. Right, if, you, if you recall, this was seen later in Matthew 17 when they're uh, trying to gather money to pay the temple tax. But the other two uh, methods that were involved, one in Matthew 4, 18 and 19, we see as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fishers of men. All right, so the type described here was fishing with a small net that the person would carry on their shoulder and they would wade out into the water and then they would throw it into the shallow areas and it would open up and then fall around the fish. There were weights on it then that would pull the net back as they would pull it in and this cord would, would tighten, trapping the fish. All right? So that is what Peter and Andrew are doing here when Jesus approaches them to be his disciples. The other type of net was a large drag net that would involve a, a large group and at times was so large that it would cover half a square mile. And it would be pulled in a circle around the fish. And this is still a method today, by the way. And, and, and it was usually between two boats in a deeper water. And it would also have weights on it to hold it down. And it would basically form a wall from the bottom of, of, of the water all the way to the top. And once they began, it would... This process would take several hours then to drag the net onto the beach. And with that kind of a system, you could imagine what types of things they were going to catch, including fish that they don't want. So what they would do, as soon as they got it onto the shore, they would immediately begin going through everything, keeping only what was good, and throwing back what they didn't want. And that is the setting of the parable of the net and what we're going to be looking at today. So if you would and are able and willing to please stand with me as we read from Matthew's Gospel, 13th chapter, verses 47 to 50. It says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. It collected every kind of fish, and when it was full, they dragged it ashore, sat down, and gathered the good fish into containers, but threw out the, the worthless ones. So what will be at the end of the age? The angels will go out, separate the evil people from the righteous, and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be in your house today. Thank you that we are able to hear from your word, your truth. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. Reveal yourself to us, Lord, and forgive us always where we fail you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. And so in this parable, the obvious net of choice was the last one that I talked about. And in this parable, Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God to a large dragnet. Right? The fishermen uh, put it into the sea, they collect all type of fish, and when it's full, they pull it back in, sit down, begin separating out the good fish from the bad ones, and they throw out the ones that were not good and worthless. And so the people would have heard this, and it would have made complete sense in the practical sense of fishing. But there would undoubtedly be questions how this kind of scene represented the kingdom of God. And thankfully, Jesus provides answers. And so in verses 49 and 50, Jesus explains what will happen. This moment of separation, what separating the fish represents, will come at the end of the age. And what this represents is a change. Not for God, but for us. Because at this point, non-believers and believers coexist. That will not always be the case, but it is for now. And we are living in what is called the church age. So the big point here at the beginning of this is God permits unbelief and unrighteousness currently, but that will not always be the case. Because at the end of this age, the judgment of God will come, and on that day, everything changes for us. Because Jesus has changed everything here already. So whether you live as a believer 
one that has accepted Jesus as your Savior, or you live with unbelief and unrighteousness. And by the way, going back to the parable of the sower, if you are living a, in unbelief and unrighteousness, that would be you if you are in any other soil but good soil. So Paul tells us what will happen. Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11, it says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the image of what is to come. For the believer, this is a glorious moment, one beyond words. But sadly, for the unbeliever, this is a moment that on that day, they will bow. They will acknowledge Jesus as Lord, but it will be all too late. Because at that point, the net had already been cast. It had silently made its way through the sea of mankind. And that day is the day that the good and the bad are separated. Understand this, that I, I say this several times throughout this morning. This is not a fire and brimstone, I want to scare you necessarily sermon. But it's a truth of what is to come. Because the time to accept Jesus as your Savior must be done in this life. Once we are dead, it's too late. Years ago, when I was a youth pastor in Collinsville, uh, we had a very thriving drama ministry. And I always have to say drama ministry because we had a plenty of drama as well. But this was the acting type. And we did a play called It's Not Too Late. And the play centered around the premise, and it was written right after the shooting in Columbine. And so the play was about a school shooting. And the whole premise of the play was sharing Jesus with people before you die. Because one day when you do, and you haven't accepted him, it is too late. But right now, it's not. And that is something we have to understand, and we have to make sure we tell people about him, because right now, it is not too late. I remember after I was saved, and I kind of got a chip on my shoulder a little bit because there were so many people who hadn't shared Jesus with me. And I knew at that point that if I would have died before that moment, I knew where I would have gone. And it was in heaven. We, this, we see this idea of good works throughout Scripture. And we're called upon to do good works because of who we believe in. But we have to ask ourselves, what is the best work you could ever do in your life? And it's say yes to Jesus. Because when we read scripture, how we will be judged by our good works, it's not talking about the nice things we did. We're only judged for one thing. Whether or not we called upon the name of Jesus as our Savior, and bowed before the king. Because it's about admitting we are sinners. It's knowing that we sin, and sin is disobedience to God. That's it. So when we die, there's not a second chance. There's no redo. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 says, And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this, judgment. So also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. After we die, Jesus is there to welcome us who have trusted and placed our faith in him. So at the end of this age, it tells us here, the angels will be deployed and they will begin the work that he has given to them. And they will begin separating, moving the wicked and unrighteous away from the righteous, those that have declared true growing faith in Jesus. Remember the parable of the sower. 
You just can't say the right things. You have to mean it. It has to be in the perfect soil for growth. And when that relates to our faith in Jesus, we actually have to believe with all of our heart or it doesn't really matter because it won't grow. What we see here from Jesus is not some exhaustive telling of what comes on the last days. Other scripture gives indication to that. But here, this is concerned with the judgment that is coming for unbelievers. John 5, 29 says, And come out, those who have done good things, to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things, to the resurrection of condemnation. Understand this. All will be judged for the decision they make now on who Christ is in their life. All will be judged for the decision they make now on who Christ is in their life. For some people, he's just a guy, an even moral guy, real, historical, a rabbi who did some really good teaching, and that's it. For some, he's a made-up figure to make us behave. For some, he is nothing. He's not real, and he offers no value, let alone salvation. And I use those examples, and you're like, oh, people don't believe that. Those are real conversations that I've had with people. I had a conversation with a guy once who used to be a deacon in his church who then told me, yeah, Jesus isn't real. Where our heart is and the soil we are in is important. We can't just say the right things. Because for those that truly believe, and maybe today is and or will be that first day for you, if you truly believe deep down, then you believe what I'm about to read to you. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, and visible, the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That is Jesus, our Savior, period. That was the point, if you recall, when we went through Colossians that Paul was making because of the discrepancy on who Jesus was. And he laid it all out there in those five verses. We will be judged on whether we believe that or not. For those that believe, to be with God is our reward forever. That is what Jesus was warning of over and over and over again. And the thing is, his message gets really repetitious. Here's the point in that. Vital truths, and change this, particularly the gospel, not such as the gospel. Vital truths, particularly the gospel, need to be repetitious. And it has to be all of it. Do you, do you realize there's, there's two sides of the gospel? They all point to the same thing. There's the good side, and there's the bad side. And today, people like to talk about the good side, but we tend to steer away from the bad side. Nobody wants to hear the bad side. It's just as vital to the message of the gospel. Because as a part of that, the joys that salvation bring, we also have to look at what happens outside of the salvation that it brings because there's punishment in that. The reality here is what good is a choice if you don't understand each side of that choice? 
the benefit versus the consequence. If I come to you and say, well, you need to accept Jesus. He's wonderful. He changes your life. And I leave it at that, and they go, so what happens, though, if I accept? Well, you know, you need to start coming to church, and you need to study the Bible. You need to read it. You need to go to Bible study. You've got to share Jesus with people. And I start listening to all these things. They're going, I could just keep doing the same thing I'm doing right now. I don't have to do all that stuff, and I can sleep in on Sunday. We have to tell them about the flip side of salvation. Because Jesus warns about the horror of hell. And he's really pleading with people to accept the salvation that's being offered to them. Understand, because people can misinterpret God's intentions and that he, he might even be okay with people going to hell. I've heard that. Well, gee, God sends people to hell. He's okay with it. Ezekiel 18, 23 says, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? And then in the New Testament, 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but, his, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He wants us to be saved. If he didn't, he would not have done what he did through Jesus. But it's about whether we accept that truth and that gift or we reject it. Because once the angels have separated the righteous from the unrighteous, the unrighteous will be cast into hell for all eternity. And here's, here's the dilemma I think we find ourselves in today. What has happened in our culture is that hell is not a scary place in culture. We glamorize it. We put it in movies. We make light of it. We almost make it seem like it's fun. I don't watch the Grammys, but apparently they were promoting it on the Grammys recently. It's not glamorous. We see it here will be a place of eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you aren't familiar with that phrase, it means anger, being upset, being miserable. This is a hard truth, but it's the truth, and it's what Jesus is dealing with right here. It's in the Bible, the authoritative word of God for us, so we have to accept it. If there's anything in here that should want to push us to share Jesus, it has to be this. Because Jesus himself was the example of sharing against this. Jesus wanted people to know about hell so they could be saved from it. He said more about hell than about love, by a large margin, and more than any other teacher in the Bible combined he warned of hell. Because he knew what that meant. He understood it. That it wasn't a fun thing or a light thing, but it was a serious thing that people needed to be saved from. God wants us to be saved. Believe that. And the reality of it, to speak on hell and warn of hell, honestly, I would argue, is love. It may be an uncomfortable topic, and it might not be the most fun, but if I'm telling you and I'm warning you and I'm sharing this truth with you, it's because I love you. Church, particularly young people, hell is not some place where you just relive bad times, and it's not a place of nothingness. And it won't be a place where you just get to keep on sinning either. It will be a place of zero pleasure, zero kindness, zero relief or comfort. Belief, true belief in Jesus is the only way we avoid that. Jesus wraps this all up in verses 51 and 52, where he says, to his disciples, have you understood all these things? 
And they answered him, yes. He goes, therefore, he said to them, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom treasures new and old. And so Jesus here, he asks the disciples, do you, do you understand this? Do you get this? Have you pieced all of this together? And it's a big question that encompasses everything that just came before this. And I really liked how this was summed up how, by John MacArthur, and he, he, he breaks this down into a question. And this is what he says. Have you understood what I've been saying about the kingdom in these parables? Do you comprehend the truth that the present form of the kingdom will continue to have good and evil in it? Do you realize that believers will continue to grow in numbers and to permeate and influence the world? Do you know that entering the kingdom involves the recognition of worthlessness of everything a person has apart from salvation in Jesus Christ? Do you see that the final separation of the righteous and the wicked is exorable and inescapable, and that the fate of both is eternal? The righteous is everlasting life, and the wicked is everlasting punishment. And so that is, that's what he's saying. Do you get this? Because if you don't, how do you declare it? And what does his disciples do? They say, yes. Now, based on later actions, their belief wasn't perfect. But Jesus accepted their answer as genuine. By the way, who, which of our belief is perfect, right? And then in the midst of this, he offers another quick parable. The parable of the head of the household. And here he's talking about scribes and other things. And a scribe was viewed as a learner, a lifelong learner. So that was growing in their understanding. And so they were to be learning and growing in their faith. But also they were to be like the head of a household. Now for those of you who are heads of households, you might be able to relate to this. The head of the household was responsible for the entire welfare of the family. And they also had to maintain the going on in the household, right? The food, the clothing, anything you might need in the house. And those things would have been kept safe in a storeroom or in a, a storehouse even. And then they would take what was needed as you needed it. They would distribute it. And if they were wise, they would be frugal with the items and would not be careless. And that's the point of this. And I think you see that in quite a bit of the parables is this idea of, of recklessness and carelessness versus taking great care of something. Because the point is this. We must take care of the gospel message but we must be generous with its just distribution. We must take care of the gospel message, but we must be generous with its distribution. And what that means is to take care of it means that we understand it, that we know it, that when people are teaching the opposite of it, that we are coming in and correcting that. We're taking care of the truth of that message. But at the same time, we have to tell others. We're not keeping it for ourselves. Remember, I talked about this last week with a pizza. We freely give it away. Because here's the thing. And bear with me on this. Hell is not necessarily a direct choice, per se. Right? If you go up to anybody on the street today and you go, Hey, do you, do you want to go to hell? Most of them are going to say no, right? Now, someone might say yes. But here's the thing. Just because they say no, no, doesn't mean they still won't go there. Unless we share with them the truth and the reality that we are sinners. And we have been since Genesis chapter 3. And there's nothing we can do about our own sin. But there's one who can. 
and his name is Jesus. And when you place your full trust and your faith in him, you are saved. And all you have to do is say, yes, Jesus, I believe. I want to live my life with you leading it. That's it. But you have to mean it. That's the message we have to share. 2 Corinthians 5.11 Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, but, we are hit, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. God's the only one who really knows. All we can do is share that message. Because we can't make anyone do anything. Here's the thing. Let me just say this. If you're trying to guilt someone into the kingdom, it's not going to work. You just have to share, and you have to pray the Holy Spirit speaks into their heart and breaks that down. Amen. That's all you can do. Nobody else can do it but him. That is left to the Lord. But we have to be the messengers because of what is at stake. And that's how he left things, didn't he? He gave us the Great Commission for a reason because that's what we are supposed to be doing. Revelation 20. I want to leave us with this, this image. And if there's a book in the Bible that truly creates images for us, it's Revelation. In Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, this is what we see. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is not metaphor. This is reality of what is to come at the end of this age. The warning that Jesus was placing and he was urging people to turn from their wickedness and to accept only the righteousness he could bring. I said this. This is not meant to scare us into salvation. But let me say this. It should scare us. If there is anything frightening to us. It should be the image and the reality of hell. It's not a place that we should want anyone, even our worst enemy, to go to. Even in our culture, in our phraseology, we've gotten very accustomed to even just using slang of telling people when we're upset with them, go to hell. That should not be anything that comes from our lips. Because if we truly understand the reality of hell, we don't want anyone going there. That is why Jesus went to such great lengths to preach and proclaim and warn people. There are people out there, there are pastors out there that preach a reality and an eternity that is void of hell. Once again, if there's no hell, then why did Jesus have to do what he did? If we are to base our example on Christ, and we should, if we preach a gospel that's void of hell, that message lacks love because there's not a full reality and understanding of what it is. 
Because our love for others doesn't always just include the good. Contrary to what society is saying these days, it also includes the bad. As a warning, we must declare Jesus is Lord. We must declare that he saves sinners from their sin. And that he saves them from a very real place called hell. That is eternal torment and misery. Let me tell you this this morning. If you're sitting there and you've never placed your trust and your faith in Jesus, I can't make you do that. But understand with all of my heart, I want you to know this. That Jesus saves and you need him. That should be our desire for everyone. And all you have to do, whether you're in this room or you're watching at home, is say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you. You are my Savior. It's, that is it. We, those that believe, have to preach that message. Here's the thing. If it was left up to me, do you, do you know how many people who live in just our area around the church who don't believe in Jesus? Do you know how long that would take me to do that on my own? We have to do it together. We are the church. And this is the message that he left for the church. Understand this, when we proclaim this, when we proclaim the entirety of it, the good and the bad, the comfortable and the uncomfortable. It is a message of love. Jesus wasn't preaching this because he wanted to scare them. He wasn't preaching this because he wanted to make them feel bad. He was preaching this to save them. That's what he wanted. It is a message of absolute truth that our Savior preached, and we need to also. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly, heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning in light of your word, Lord, in the heaviness that this brings. God, as much as we just want to talk about your amazing love all the time, we have to understand there's a, another side of that that is void of you. And hell is a place void of you. And that if we do not place our trust in you, that's where we'll go. Lord, we don't want that for anyone. God, I pray that through your word, through your parable, that it stirs in our hearts. That it makes us realize, for those of us who believe, that, that this is a important message not just for us to know but for us to share God as we have seen through your word this morning that this is a, a message that we have to be willing to without restriction share with everybody we can God I pray that for us this morning stir in our hearts Stir our conversations this afternoon and this evening and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And God, I pray this morning that if there's someone with us this morning or online this morning that doesn't know you, Lord, that they give your li their life to you. They say, yes, Lord, Jesus, you are my Savior. And Lord, that when that happens, we celebrate that because of how Jesus taught us, we understand what they are saved from. God, have us be bold. Have us be steadfast. Have us be proclaimers of your word. God, we are so incredibly blessed, and I would say thankful for the salvation that you bring us and what it saves us from. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Please stand. We sing 275 in your hymnals. I surrender all.
I know that was a heavy sermon, <laughs> but it's a heavy topic, but it's a true topic that we find in the Word, and I just want to encourage you all, as you go out this week, before you leave today, read the sign as you walk out those doors, and I pray, I pray for every one of us, me included, that God put someone in our path this week that we get to share him with, because that's what we need to be doing. We know the joys of salvation, and we know the consequences of that rejection. Let's share Jesus with someone this week. Before we close, I also want to just remind you and, and encourage you all, who likes football? I'm trying to lighten it up a little before I let you go. <laughs> like four of you. Okay. Here's what I want to tell you. Don't come tonight because you like football. Come tonight because you love being with each other. Because that's more of the point to getting together tonight for the Super Bowl party than watching the stupid football game. My team's not in it, so I don't really care. But, <laughs> but more than anything, I look forward to being with everybody. And so please plan on coming, whether you like football or not. Come for a little bit. But here's also what I want to encourage you to do. Come at four. Come for our prayer service. Stay for the fellowship. All right. Rich, would you close us out in prayer today? Father God, thank you. Thank you for the many joys that you've given us, the many privileges that you've given us. And Father, I pray that after listening to this message that we would just be on fire for you and to share people, share it with people, Lord, because we don't want anyone going to hell, Lord, but unless we tell them, they're going to go. Just be with us as we leave this place. Just pray that you'll put somebody in our pathways. In Jesus' name, amen.